anybody, even though all their lines say that they are muted. They're all, I can see them talking, but I can't hear them. But, um, where are they? No, everyone's muted. Hmm? Everyone's muted right now. Yeah, but it's kind of fun. I know. <clears throat> All right. Hello. Put me on. Where's the volume? Hang on one second. It was up before. It's all the way up. Okay, yeah. So when you put your thing back on, your video, start video. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Last three lattices. Hello. Yes. She called me. She returned my call. When I called the other day and I said that you had already talked to her and I want to thank you, thank you for the trouble. Then we talked about Painter and the school store is, they have a school store, so maybe I'll sneak down next week and get a t-shirt. So I would appreciate the wear. All right. We didn't talk about anything else. We spent more time on Painter. And I told her all my director is still alive. She, I said he's going to be 102. I said, so if you're a state employee, you're going to have a good, you're going to have a good life. So I, I have no idea how old she is, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. You, we got a good. I said nothing. About it. Okay, my meeting said at 10 o'clock meeting time. I think we'll call this meeting to order. It is 10.02. And uh, thank you all for being here. And thanks uh, to those who are also uh, present online. Um, I think we'll start out with Mayor Hess leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation. One nation, under God. Thank you. Mark, you want to do the roll call? Did you want to do the presentations first, or do you want to open the meeting first? I'm open the meeting. If you okay. do the roll call, then we'll do the presentations. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Uh, Mayor Cassetti, City of Ansonia. Or Sheila. Or Sheila. Here and there. Uh, for Selectman uh, Smith, Deacon Falls. Uh, is he, is he on right? Yeah, there we go. Okay. There he is. There's Jerry. I can hear uh, the first voice. second. Sorry, Bethel. Yeah, okay. uh, Mayor Caggiano, Bristol. Here. Okay. Um, and from uh, let's have alternate uh, Mr. Martelli, alternate for uh, Town of Cheshire. Yeah. Okay, he's indicating the uh, uh, virtual Mayor Zeke and Derby. Here. Uh, First Selectman St. John Middlebury. Here. Uh, Mayor Hess uh, Naugatuck. Here. First Selectman Temple Oxford. Here. Mayor Kilduff Plymouth. Here. Uh, Mayor Chatfield. I... He's here. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay, thank you. I'm here. Um, for select woman, Dragona Town of Seymour. Okay, she was indicated virtual. Um, Mayor Loretti of Shelton, he was going to be here in person, hasn't, hasn't arrived. Um, for select in Manville, Southbury. Taking a train now. Okay, he'd be virtual, not, not yet. Okay. Um, First Selectman Moan of Thomason. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, Mayor O'Leary of Waterbury. Here. Um, yeah. Town Manager Mark Ramio from Watertown. Here. 
Thank you. Um, uh, Mayor Dunn from Walpit indicated he would not be able to make it. And first select women Perkinson of Woodbury. She indicated she'd be virtual. She's here. She, okay, she's here. All right. Uh, here. Do you have a quorum for both the uh, CMV MPO and the uh, MVCOG board? Okay. So we have a couple of presentations this morning. Uh, first, we're going to start out with. Um, Let's see who we have here. Jessica LeClaire of Sustainable VP. Jessica. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I'm going to just try to share a screen here. Oh, I guess you have the slide, so we're good. Um, excellent. Well, thank you all for letting me share with you some updates on the Sustainable CT framework. Uh, next slide, please. I know you have a tight schedule, so I'm gonna just give a quick overview of Sustainable CT and walk you through some of our certification updates and wrap up with uh, highlighting some of our technical supports available. Next slide. Next slide. So many of you might be familiar with what Sustainable CT is, but just in case anyone is new, uh, Sustainable CT is a statewide municipal certification program intended to help Connecticut cities and towns advance their overall sustainability. And we take a very broad look at sustainability. So we're thinking about arts and culture, public health, housing, homelessness prevention, land and natural resources, really everything that makes a community a place where people want to live, work and play. At the core of the program, we have a menu of actions, which are essentially sustainability best practices that your cities and towns can pick from, work on those actions, get points, and then eventually get certified if that is a goal of yours. We want towns to be successful in the program, so we do have different technical assistance and funding opportunities available to registered cities and towns. Next slide, please. So the, the program is really built up of actions. You have the, the flexibility to pick and choose actions that make sense to you and your community. Um, and I wanted to show this screen to show the breadth of sustainability and how we're thinking about this as a topic. So there are actions that relate to materials management, to health and wellness, to transportation, to local economies, uh, to energy infrastructure and operations and more. So a lot of the work that you're doing and thinking about as a municipality, we're, we're trying to think about as well. Next slide. And just to give you some examples of what actions might look like, uh, here are some. So it could be that your community is working on watershed protection programs. Perhaps you have arts and culture initiatives going on, or you have agriculture friendly practices, or you're reducing energy use in municipal buildings. We have about 70 actions in the program and hundreds of sub actions. So we really have tried hard to create a menu that will work for all of Connecticut cities and towns, whether you're Danbury or Bethlehem or anywhere in between. Next slide. We launched Sustainable CT in November of 2018, and since then, 131 towns have passed resolutions to join the program. And we just had our most recent town join last month, which would be the community of Westbrook. So towns can join at any time. There's no cost. There's no obligation to get certified. Um, and we've tried to keep that, that level of entry um, pretty, pretty simple and streamlined. I'm happy to answer any questions if anyone has, uh, has any questions. We have about 59 towns right now who are currently certified in the program, and our certified towns have completed more than 3,000 sustainability actions. So there's really a lot of amazing work that's happening out across the state, as you know, and we're happy to highlight and recognize that work through certification. I'll touch on our community match fund in a bit, but I just want to say that we do have a funding program available. It's a one-to-one -one matching program, and since we've released this funding opportunity in September of 2019, so basically right before the pandemic, almost $3 million has gone to Connecticut cities and towns to complete small community projects. Um, so half of that, nearly 3 million would be from Sustainable CT and half from residents voting for projects that they wanna see in their backyards or in their neighborhoods. Next slide, please. So I wanna give a shout out to the NV COG municipalities who've achieved certification. So you have Bristol, Cheshire, and Southbury, and you've really done some amazing work. So kudos to these communities. Next slide. Next slide. <laughs> um, so really quickly, without going into the weeds, I wanted to share some updates to our certification requirements. Again, I'm not going to. I'm not going to go into the details too much, but I really want to let you know that this is an iterative program. 
So if you've looked at the program in the past at 2018 or 2019, it'll look a lot different today. We're getting feedback from communities all of the time. We're getting feedback from state agencies, from nonprofits, from thought leaders in the sustainability field. The laws are changing. So we're trying to be responsive and create a program again that will work for all of our cities and towns and that one that is also looking forward to these changing sustainability best practices across, across the state. So um, next slide, please. What you saw on the former slide was that we do have a bronze and a silver certification level, and that's what we've had until 2023. The exciting element for 2023 onward is we've gotten gold. We have a whole new level of certification available to communities who wanna dig deeper. And we are looking for gold communities to dig deeper on a few areas in particular, equity, climate, and then also collaborating with other municipalities. Next slide. To highlight our climate leader designation, this is an opportunity for towns who'd like to do more with regard to reducing greenhouse gas emissions or building their resilience as a town. Um, this is something we piloted in 2022 with a real focus on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Though we did hear from towns that you wanna be thinking about how to prepare for the impacts we're seeing. I don't know about you, but where I live in the state, it was 70 degrees yesterday. I took the dog for a walk in a t-shirt. That's not quite normal. Uh, we're seeing lots of changes, uh, whether we like them or not. So we've got to start to think differently about how we design and respond to our, our towns. So we did add a resilience component to the climate leader designation. This is an optional add-on for bronze and silver communities and it is required for gold. Next slide. So I just want to wrap up with talking about some of the supports available to registered towns. Next slide, please. So any registered town, whether or not you're pursuing a certification, can work with any of our, you know, you excuse me, utilize any of our resources. We have equity coaches on our team who can help you with our equity actions. They can also have a conversation with you if something has occurred in your town that it would be helpful to talk with an equity professional about how you might move forward with that. There's also a lot of money, as you all know, coming down the road from the federal government. And a lot of that funding does have equity requirements, environmental justice requirements. So if you're thinking about putting together project proposals and would like to consult with an equity coach about how to engage the community or meet the Justice 40 requirements, you can work with an equity coach at no cost to your town. We offer workshops and trainings throughout the year on various topics. Usually we try to match up with what we're hearing, what are some questions from towns, and how can we pull together a panel or get an expert who can talk about how to do that particular thing. For instance, last year we were getting a lot of questions on how to calculate your per capita waste, so we had someone from DEEP come in and, and walk towns through how to do that. Uh, next week we have someone from Bike Friendly America coming out to talk about creating bike friendly communities, so it varies and we try to do workshops at least every month uh, on many different kinds of topics. We partner with different technical assistance providers to provide essentially free consulting support to towns on various actions. Uh, some examples, we work with the Nature Conservancy to provide free community resilience building workshops for towns. These sessions are really wonderful opportunities to have some key staff come together, assess some of your vulnerabilities to climate change and natural hazards and think about what you're really good at and how you want to continue to be really good and strong in certain areas and how you can reduce some of those vulnerabilities that you've identified. We also work with an organization called Smart Building CT, which is based out of Yukon that can help communities set up their energy benchmarking and tracking, help you get energy audits for buildings set up at no cost um, and more. And there are assistance opportunities available to towns, which are available on our website. And we also have a fellowship program. So each summer, we have grad and undergraduate students out at your COG. Usually we have two students providing direct support to towns. They could be helping you do um, documentation for your certification process. They can help you figure out where you have points already scored. They can help you with GIS work, or they can help you with graphic design or running events. They're really amazing. Um, and the possibilities are endless. We've, we've been very lucky to have some very thoughtful and energetic students over the past five years work with us and work with you as a result. Oh, next slide. 
So to wrap up, just quickly highlighting our community match fund, this is available to all registered communities and anyone in a registered community has access. So it could be the town, it could be a commission, it could be a nonprofit, it could be an individual with no nonprofit status, but has a project that has a public good that they really care about. The projects need to align directly or indirectly with one of our 70 very diverse actions. Uh, we'll match one-to-one -one up to $7,500 per project, though there's more funding available for projects that have a climate benefit. And again, since September of 2019, more than 240 projects have gone up across the state um, and about $3 million has been invested, half from us, half from people wanting to see cool things, again, in their neighborhood, in their community. Um, Types of projects include community gardens, uh, curbside compost pilots, um, purchasing EV charging stations. Um, people have put up art murals or held festivals or educational events. Uh, just really the sky's the limit. And you can go and visit these projects now. It's really neat to see they're, they're here. Um, people get excited about them and feel a sense of ownership by giving five or 20 bucks to see something neat happen. Uh, in their community. So we're excited about this and whether or not you're certified or seeking certification, you are eligible for the community match fund. So I wanna flag that if that's of interest or you think it could be a benefit to your city or town. And that's it for me. So I'd be happy to take any questions if there are any. Through the chair, I do have one quick question to see if you have contemplated anything at all in any other towns. Uh, I, I think I'm the only one here that's going to tell you that we have had a little uproar on the nipper tax, I'll call it. And what I also put a quotation is the unfunded mandate for us to deal with it. And some of these smaller towns, I, I think this is something that could come around. Have you had any thought about um, using, and we are certified and we have some very qualified and capable people in our public works department that have really gotten us to where we are. So I haven't done much with this program, but any ideas? and how we can use this type of platform to, to help us collect those nippers and do something with them? Well, yeah, we actually had a webinar, um, gosh, it was last month. Uh, it feels like it was forever ago, but it was just last month. And we featured several communities who are using that uh, mini liquor bottle funding in unique ways. Um, some ways that <clears throat> align with our actions or could align with the actions and some that are just interesting. One example is Ridgefield. They've used the money to hire a part-time recycling coordinator. Um, so they could be thinking about how to improve recycling and maybe reduce the, the NIP waste in town. Um, you know, the town that I live in is thinking about having a small grant program for organizations that want to run curbside cleanups. Um, but I'm happy to share the recording of that uh, conversation we had with the, the panel of town. So we had someone from Ridgefield speak, someone from Middletown, and someone from Manchester. Um, and they all different examples. And I can't speak to them all because I actually had a different meeting during that time. <laughs> yeah, I was not on that, but I think some of our people internally mm -hmm. were, but, were, but I would love to uh, pass that around if you don't mind. Oh, absolutely. That. absolutely. That would be great. Thanks, Any other questions or comments for Jessica? Thank you, Jessica. Nice job. Thank you so much. Everyone have a wonderful weekend. We always love to have you. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay. Next on the agenda that you won't see on your, <laughs> in the written form, unfortunately, is I added this on. Um, we have two more speakers this morning. Um, I have uh, representatives on the phone or on the Zoom uh, from USA uh, Recycle. Uh, they are our uh, municipal solid waste uh, folks, both uh, on the recycle side and the and the waste side. So here's what's happening, folks. The last year there was a Senate bill that was presented, Senate Bill 115, that was pretty onerous on the cities and towns. Um, and we use the word unfunded mandates around here an awful lot because that's what happens whenever they go back in the session. And uh, honestly, it was pretty alarming, uh, the costs that would be passed on to cities and towns. Fortunately, it didn't go anywhere. However, it's resurrected itself again uh, <laughs> this year under the uh, 
Uh, it's uh, under actually a bill that was raised by the governor um, in conjunction with the uh, DEEP. And uh, so I asked the uh, USA to join us this morning to give us a, a just a brief presentation why it's timely to put them on the agenda this morning is there may or may not be some public hearings over the next week or two that are gonna be important for this. Ultimately, what I would really like to do is to, for those towns that are interested is to, after today's presentation, if you are interested, I would like to get them back here, maybe even in person and talk just a little bit more about the MSW crisis in Connecticut, the recycling, and then now the new twist, of course, is this organic food um, processing. That is, we really honestly need to pay close attention to this. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Chris Antonacci and Ed Spinella and turn, the, turn it over to you guys. Good morning, Mayor, and everyone on the board. Uh, can you hear us? We yes, can. we can. Okay, uh, my name is Ed Spinella and I appreciate the opportunity to speak with all of you. Just a quick background. Uh, I've been representing waste management companies in the state of Connecticut for 40 years. Uh, I have been uh, on a few task force uh, created by uh, the uh, leadership of the uh, state representatives. Uh, I was on the task force to study waste energy uh, facilities in the state of Connecticut. And I was also on the task force uh, that studied uh, the EPR uh, programs and uh, as a side note, uh, after we had that task force, the task force voted uh, 63 uh, not to support EPR in the state of Connecticut. Uh, just briefly, before we get into the little bit of the nuts and bolts, and we know that we don't have much time today, is that uh, I think it's important for all of you, even though I think each and every one of you uh, has a pretty good understanding of what's going on in Connecticut because uh, your material is being collected and properly recycled and processed. But I think it's important for all of you to understand that uh, there is no waste crisis in the state of Connecticut. Uh, people uh, use that term uh, and they have different definitions for it, but I think that uh, we, you all understand and I think I would like to remind you that uh, all 169 towns, uh, their material is collected at the curb. Uh, uh, their recyclables are brought to facilities in the state of Connecticut that have capacity to accept approximately 4 million tons of recyclables a year. Uh, their capacity is far greater than what we need in the state of Connecticut. Uh, we have four uh, waste energy facilities that uh, are up and running. Uh, and uh, we also have uh, markets out of state to handle uh, waste that does not go to the in-state waste energy facilities. State of Connecticut has one of the most robust infrastructures in the United States for handling recyclables and MSW. There are approximately 100 uh, local drop-offs throughout the state, local transfer stations. Uh, my clients alone, USA Hauling, Murphy Road, All-American Waste, uh, and F&G Recycling have uh, 19 facilities in the state of Connecticut uh, that accept uh, C&D uh, recyclables uh, as well as MSW. And there are many, many more uh, transfer stations operated by private uh, operators in the state of Connecticut. And uh, those uh, transfer stations and local drop-offs are crucial to the state uh, to in fact be self-sustaining. Uh, they have the capacity to accept all the material in the state of Connecticut and also to transfer that material to the in-state waste energy facilities as well as to the out-of-state facilities. I think one of the things that you often hear is that uh, sending material to out-of-state landfills is, is uh, not good policy. I think that uh, there's another side to that story, which is that uh, today's modern landfills that uh, in Ohio and Pennsylvania and throughout the country are modern landfills uh, that uh, capture uh, methane and use the methane uh, to fuel uh, vehicles and equipment, and, as well as create electricity uh, in the communities where they're located. In many ways, a modern landfill is no different uh, than the quantum uh, 
uh, anaerobic digester facility in uh, Southington. Uh, they both capture methane and, and use it to create energy. Uh, I think that it's important to understand that uh, we don't, uh, we're not opposed, just like you're not opposed to innovative and modern ways to handle uh, MSW and recycling. Uh, one of the, the most advanced uh, recycling facilities in the United States is uh, operated by my clients, uh, Murphy Road Recycling. And mo most of your, most, uh, many of you who do work business with us, that material goes to that recycling facility in Berlin, Connecticut. Uh, that's wow. a 40 million. That's a $40 million operation that uh, recycles, among other things today, uh, years ago it wasn't recycled, uh, is glass. Uh, glass now is recycled by uh, that facility. And I think that it would be wonderful if you take the opportunity someday to visit that Berlin facility. We have people throughout the world now visiting that facility including uh, uh, people from British Columbia that are EPR advocates because they don't have the infrastructure that Connecticut has. So uh, I think what we'd like to do now is just briefly go into the uh, bill that uh, is presently uh, up at the legislature. That bill addresses uh, EPR uh, for paper and packaging. It addresses uh, organics, uh, source separation of organics uh, it uh, addresses the uh, closing of Mira. Uh, uh, by the way, some of you, uh, I'm sure, under, uh, at one time or another were members of Mira, and some of your towns uh, recently left Mira uh, to go with private operators. Uh, in that bill, uh, there's a provision that uh, the, all the reserves that are presently at Mira, which are approximately $57 million, uh, those reserves were built up by uh, all the towns that were paying tip fees. And according to this bill, uh, those $57 million in reserves are going to be swept and they cannot be distributed to the, the towns that previously were members. Uh, so that might pique your interest. Uh, but uh, because we don't have much time, uh, Christopher uh, Antonacci, uh, who's an in-house attorney at uh, the companies, is going to speak to you briefly about EPR and I'll speak to you about some other provisions in the bill. Feel free at any time to interrupt us and uh, we'll answer all the questions that you have today. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Ed. Uh, and thank you all. Um, really appreciate being invited here uh, to speak with you about this. Um, as Ed said, we've been kind of pouring over this HB 6664, the governor's bill, um, that's been introduced. We've really kind of focused in on three main areas that, that we see uh, kind of impacting municipalities. Um, the first being uh, EPR for, for pa paper and packaging products. Um, that being, uh, that meaning basically everything in the grocery store, everything in the Target, everything that you consume over Amazon um, would be, uh, would come under this bill and be essentially taxed. Um, it is kind of one of the, the, the bigger government overreaches that I've seen in my legal career. Uh, it is basically state-sponsored in industry takeover where uh, they will turn over the keys of all of Connecticut's recycling infrastructure, everything from collection at the curb to processing at a, at a MRF, a material recycling facility like the one we just built in Berlin, to the actual marketing and, and shipping to uh, recyclers across the country and across the globe, they'll turn that entire industry over to the national and multinational producers. So the Coca-Colas of the world, the PepsiCo's, the Nestle's, the Unilever. Um, thinking about this, I kind of, I liken it to kind of putting the fox in charge of the hen house. In fact that, uh, you know, everyone laments the plastics crisis that we've had uh, mostly because of the multinational companies that we, I just spoke about have not done anything to take <laughs> to, to take responsibility for their plastics. And now we're handing over the keys to the entire industry to them. Um, but uh, at the municipal level, uh, it's, it's really unnecessary. And in Connecticut, it's, it's truly unnecessary. Connecticut is a top three recycler already in the country uh, by all metrics. 
it has universal access to curbside recycling, uh, which is not true in most of the 50, uh, 49 other states. Um, people will talk about British Columbia as a uh, shining example of EPR working. Uh, e British Columbia, I think, had you know, much less than 50% access to curbside recycling when EPR was introduced there. Uh, as Ed alluded to before, Connecticut also has the one of, if not the most robust uh, recycling infrastructure from a facility standpoint in the country as well. Our facility in Berlin is the most state-of-the-art facility in the country and probably the world. It's the largest, it has the most technologically sophisticated with robots and optical sorters. It is collecting and recovering recyclables at a rate that is unseen uh, before. Um, so, and we are just one of four of the MRFs in the state that have abundant capacity to take all the recycling that the state generates. Um, for your all information, it's, you would basically lose control of any of your recycling uh, services. Uh, you would, it would basically be handing over the keys to this, uh, this producer organization that is run by multinationals that really have no local uh, accountability. Um, DEEP has some oversight in this bill, um, but uh, it would be mostly run by Unilever, Nestle, PepsiCo, they would determine the level of service that your residents receive. They would determine the level of reimbursement that you receive for your services. So when they say that you'll save 100% of your, your recycling budget, that is, I believe, an, an untrue statement. You'll, you'll receive what these multinationals deem as a reasonable reimbursement. Um, no one knows what that reasonableness means. Um, in short, uh, well, and municipalities, if it is removed from the budget, that might be one thing, but the consumer and the residents of your towns will certainly be paying at the cash register. Um, the recycling system costs money. We all know that. It costs money to collect the recyclables. It costs money to run the facilities. It costs money to run the entire infrastructure. Uh, to say that it'll relieve everybody in the city of Connecticut, the municipalities and the residents, uh, of their of a financial obligation to, to pay for recycling is just an untrue statement. It just shifts the burden from municipal bu budgets to the consumer. Um, there are studies out there that say that uh, uh, a average family of fours uh, grocery bills, just groceries alone, not considering other consumer goods, but grocery alone will increase between three and 5% on an annual basis, just because of this EPR bill. Um, in lower income communities, studies have shown that this, or, or models have shown that this will be a greater impact. And so uh, we believe that this is a totally unnecessary uh, action and, and represents a, a stark departure from uh, you know, past practice and, and, and a big gov government overreach uh, into the recycling industry that has already made Connecticut a top three in the world, or top three in the country, rather. So. Um, with that, as Ed said before, we're happy. We know a lot about this EPR bill. We've studied them across the country. We've studied uh, all the studies about this. So we know a ton about this. We'd be happy to come back in and dive in further uh, or answer any questions that you have. But uh, I'll turn it back over to Ed to discuss about the other uh, couple sections of the bill. Uh, before I get to the bill, does anyone uh, have any questions about uh, the APR uh, program and, and uh, uh, what Chris just said before I go on, I, 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 you know, if it's better to go forward with the questions now, feel free, or would you prefer that I, I continue? I have a question. To go on? Sure. We have a question from uh, Mayor Loretti Shelton. Go yeah. ahead. So, so tell me what's driving this new concept of uh, recycling, and what makes anybody think that the government can do it more efficient than than private industry? Uh, that that's a good question. <laughs> um, <laughs> There, Deep has been, uh, to be frank, Deep has been kind of enamored with this concept for a long time. Uh, mm -hmm. We believe that EPR systems work for certain materials, hard to handle materials that there isn't a robust infrastructure to handle. For example, uh, paint, right? Makes sense. Tires mm -hmm. might make sense. Uh, batteries might make sense. So things that are hard to handle, things that are dangerous to handle or hazardous to handle, 
that makes sense to have a separate sort of collection system. For packaging and, and paper products like this, we have a, an entirely mature system already built. Um, you know, uh, people will look at, uh, or people bring up British Columbia. British Columbia is really the only jurisdiction in North America that has a EPR system actually running it in place. Other jurisdictions have passed legislation. Ontario, for example, passed one, I believe, 10 or 12 years ago, has still not been implemented because of the complexity of the whole issue, right? So you bring up a good point. We believe that it's definitely not gonna be more efficient. You're, la you're layering on at least two levels of bureaucracy onto a recycling industry uh, that's already operating very effectively and cost efficiently. Um, so your costs are gonna go up, you're, you're gonna stifle innovation, uh, you're going to do all these things that, that are unintended consequences. The, the best that the proponents can do is point to British Columbia and say British Columbia's recycling rates went up overnight or, or went up after, as a result of EPR. But that's because, like I said, British Columbia didn't have universal access to curbside recycling. Of course, if they introduce EPR that mandates universal access to recycling, your recycling rate's going to go up, right? But... Uh, there really is no, there is no objective evidence to show that EPR will work in a jurisdiction with an already mature recycling industry. Any other questions? I know that the, I'm hoping that you're going to talk about this organic, a minute on this organic food waste. Uh, yes. Also. Yeah. Yes, Mayor. Why don't, we do, why don't we dive into that and then there may okay. be other questions. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Uh, what the, uh, DEP is, uh, says is because uh, there's a, a crisis which we don't believe there exists. Because of this crisis, the, frankly, DEP has been saying there's been a crisis because we're not self-sufficient. Uh, uh, we go back all the way to 2006 in the solid waste management plan where they said that uh, there was a crisis and it's, the, the narrative hasn't changed. Uh, one of the ways that uh, the state of Connecticut deep uh, believes that we uh, have to get out of this crisis is to uh, do something with organics. And we do not oppose uh, doing something with organics. Uh, I think all the uh, companies in the state of Connecticut are not opposed to organics programs. Uh, we should really say it's food scraps because that's the focus. Uh, but what the concern that we have, and I think that all of you should have, is that there are a lot of tools in the toolbox about how to handle uh, material in the state of Connecticut, whether it's recyclables, uh, whether it's your, your ordinary garbage, or whether it's food scraps. So let's focus on food scraps. Uh, the DEP uh, it has put in this bill, uh, and I can refer you to the specific section if you wanted to follow me. Uh, it's uh, section five lines 959 through 967. And what the DEP uh, says is that uh, by October 1, 2028, there must be source separation of uh, food scraps. Uh, in other words, uh, you're gonna source separate food scraps the same way that you're source separating your recyclables in your house. Uh, that would mean that you're going to uh, put in your homes, as well as businesses, but let's just focus on the residents. Uh, they'll have in their homes some type of a container where they'll scrap, uh, scrape the food off their plates. They'll put it into that container, uh, which will have a plastic bag. And then that plastic bag will be brought out to a third container or cart that's out in the backyard that will ultimately be put out to the curb. Uh, and uh, that's called source separated uh, food scrap program. And you'll notice in the bill that uh, the municipalities uh, must put that in place on or before October 1st, 2028. Now, uh, what do you, how, how does that happen? Uh, in other words, if that material is source separated at the residence uh, home and then it's put at the, cart, uh, at the curb, it's gonna be put in a separate cart. Uh, which means that you're going to have to have another vehicle uh, put on, put a route, create a route to, to pick up that material. 
then that material has to be brought to a different type of facility, uh, uh, anaerobic digester facility or a compost facility. And frankly, there are very few in the state of Connecticut. All that uh, is expensive. Uh, it's time consuming and uh, frankly, it's uh, not that convenient for the people, but it's certainly a program that people can join. We presently provide uh, organic uh, food scrap services to many businesses in the state of Connecticut. We've done pilot programs uh, with uh, a few towns in the state of Connecticut and we're looking to do more of those. Another way that uh, the food scraps can be handled uh, is that it, it can be uh, put in plastic bags in the home and then those plastic bags are put in the cart with also plastic bags that have the other garbage. And that material is then collected and it has to be brought to a transfer station where the plastic bags are sorted. Uh, and then those plastic bags, depending on what they have, the food scraps, for example, they would be sorted and they would be brought to a different facility uh, and then the other bags that are regular garbage, they would be brought to uh, the ordinary disposal facilities such as waste energy and out-of-state facilities. Uh, what's interesting about this is that uh, there are other ways to handle uh, food scraps. And this bill does not allow other ways to handle food scraps. Uh, another way to handle food scraps is to put all of the, uh, the garbage in one cart. It could include food scraps, it could include everyday garbage, and all that material then, then can be brought to a facility uh, where that uh, material is all tipped on a floor and then used with equipment. And the equipment then, for example, sorts out uh, the food scraps. Basically, it squeezes the, uh, uh, all the material and you get a sludge. Uh, and then the, the equipment also sorts out some recyclables that uh, can be recovered from the uh, MSW, and then the remainder of the MSW will go to a facility. Uh, uh, and that's just one of the uh, systems that's out there that uh, people should look at and explore. And frankly, we're looking at it and exploring that. But unfortunately, he doesn't want to permit it. They muted themselves. You guys, uh, you mute, uh, somehow you muted yourselves, guys. Oh, apologies. Okay. So, <laughs> well, so under this bill, you basically have an unfunded mandate, just like you had an unfunded mandate uh, in the 90s with single stream recycling. Uh, you're being told it has to be done, and you're being told you're going to pay for it. Uh, how are you going to pay for it? Well, uh, frankly, one of the ways that you can pay for it is by uh, bags and, and those and these are the plastic bags that a company called waste zero has been recommending uh, to many of the towns uh, and uh, that's a, a backdoor approach to get uh, unit based pricing also known as pay as you throw uh, most of the towns in the state of Connecticut uh, uh, their leaders their local leaders uh, are against pay as you throw uh, they're against unit based pricing uh, but and uh, frankly uh, there are leaders up at the, at the House of Representatives that have said that they are opposed to statewide uh, unit based pricing uh, a, a good thing to keep in mind is that in the state of Connecticut, there have been a few uh, experimental programs where towns have tried uh, organic uh, organics at the curbside. Uh, and one of those towns is uh, a city of Meriden. They had a thousand households uh, that uh, over a four or six month period that had this curbside program with plastic bags. And the results of that, which DEP has uh, uh, you know, published, are that they recovered 13 tons of food scraps from 1,000 homes over a four-month period. Uh, that was an increase of 4% uh, more material that was diverted. Yet I'm sure that each and every one of you have heard time and time again with these food programs that there'll be a 44% increase in diversion. Uh, the, the only program so far in the state of Connecticut that has produced data shows that the increase was 4%. Uh, the other thing that you should know is there are presently 18 grants that have been provided to uh, towns and regional authorities in the state of Connecticut to, to do these programs. 
Uh, there's 15 towns and there's three regional authorities. All of those programs will end in about a year and we'll have all of that data uh, after a year to analyze it, just like we have the Meriden data to see what, if in fact these programs are productive and whether or not they're cost effective. And unfortunately, this bill doesn't wait to see the results of that data. It specifically says that you shall have in place on or before October 1st, 2028, a, uh, a source separated program for uh, food scraps. It's unfortunate that we're not waiting for that data. So, so that, that's the... Uh, that's another true unfunded mandate, and, and not only is it unfunded, but it's uh, it's tying your arms where you're, you're limited in terms of the options to go with. Um, finally, and, and to wrap it up, uh, there is a, a third part that is maybe uh, just as, as concerning for you all, uh, and that Section 8 of the bill is introducing a solid waste assessment. Um, as you know, as you might know already, there's a dollar fifty solid waste assessment for all uh, for each ton that goes to a waste energy facility in the state of Connecticut. DEP, uh, though, in the governor's bill, though, citing uh, reasons for the bill being, you know, skyrocketing tip fees, believes uh, that uh, increasing a solid waste assessment to three dollars for all in-state uh, waste energy tons and to five dollars a ton for out-of-state trash is a good idea. Um, this will just this will do more than anything to actually to increase tip fees. And actually, in that in that section of the bill, there is a explicit language saying that the customer and or municipality who is generating that uh, that tonnage is responsible for the uh, for the assessment. So it's really easy to see that the budget impact on you guys. If you have a, a you know your municipal tons, you take that number times it by five. That's going to be added first year uh, to the budget. So, and that goes straight to deep for them to, or Jonathan? Yeah, no, no. Uh, what happens is that uh, there's currently a dollar fifty uh, on the material that goes to waste energy. That goes to the general fund. With this bill, the dollar fifty is increasing to three dollars for all MSW that's going to the in-state waste energy facilities. But that increased assessment is going to go to deep uh, that yeah. revenue. Additionally, there's a five dollars put on all the other material that uh, goes like C and D. Keep going, keep going. Yeah, so it's 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 a massive increase in tip fees, um, and we again we don't want to take up too much time, but uh, we'd be happy to come back and discuss more, especially you know kind of our vision of the future. Uh, you've heard us kind of uh, bring up our concerns here. Um, our vision of the future is is pretty uh, is not as bleak as deeps and and maybe the governor's bill has shown. Uh, we're already a leader. A lot of technological advancements in the state and infrastructure advancements in the state have already been done without legislative or regulatory incentive. Um, and so uh, we believe that uh, kind of incentivizing private industry and uh, these kind of municipal and private partnerships, such as the ones that we have with, with so many of these towns that are uh, present is the right way to go. Giving municipal leaders the control over their own services, what their residents want. If residents want an organics program and uh, they run a cost benefit, then that, that's great. We'll, and we'll be there to support it. Um, but if they don't, then that should be up to uh, local municipal control. Uh, so again, we're happy to we're happy to discuss and come back. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't get a presentation together in time, but uh, we'd be happy to uh, put a more formal presentation in with some citations and everything if you would like. Um, but again, thank you all for your time and, and we'll welcome any questions. Yeah, I think what we'll do is uh, we'll put together a workshop um, as we mentioned earlier. Um, and, um, you know, we'll have time to, uh, more time for Q and a, uh, but this, uh, presentation or this, uh, um, information that you provided this morning is, is really important to put on our radar, especially because of this, uh, pending legislation or proposed legislation, I should say. Mayor Hess. I was going to say what you said. We should mm -hmm. definitely bring them back with our own <laughs> internal group and talk in much more detail. We could talk about this for weeks. So, yeah. but we're working with USA now. They have a lot of positive uh, information and um, 
I think we need to study it ourselves and control our own destiny to the extent we can. Yeah, and to that said too, is uh, they did, I haven't seen it, I've read about the new facility that they referred to in Berlin, it's a state-of-the-art sorting facility, yes. and it's amazing, yes. and I would, uh, I would uh, ask that uh, we take a field trip out yeah. there, we have um, and go, yeah. yeah, okay, so. We would, we would love to have you. All right. So listen, uh, we're grateful for your time. We're grateful for the information. We're going to reinvite you back for the workshop and then maybe the field trip as well in the near future. And uh, we appreciate both of you and uh, your time this morning and uh, the information provided. Okay. Thank that you, everyone. Good. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. So, Mayor, <laughs> if I may just interject a little bit, I'm, I'm, I'm currently on the board of director of the mayor. So I'm well aware of what sure and little a lot of this stuff. Uh, to their point, the funds will be swept. Harper has already determined that they're going to so utilize all that funding to yeah, all our money, to, right? To force us we to away. remediate that piece of property uh, to the benefit of Harper. Clearly, they want to do that so that if there's any residual effect after what we should have been required to do, my way that is, um, to relieve that obligation of a Harper to just see the state to do it, right? To make it what they want it to be a usable property again along the river. That's the first point. <laughs> um, so, and, and by the way, the, the bill indicates that Myra goes away on June of 2025. That's, that's its last, that's its step now. Of course, they're already in the process of telling us what we're going to do. And they're going to, this June, this, or this July, excuse me, they're going to reconstitute the board in the manner in which they want. Honestly, they'll be doing me a great favor if they don't ask me to go on it again. Right. But with that said, um, the other pieces, and I think this is important. Um, a, they also are prohibiting this is currently, they, they will prohibit or the expansion, and Bristol can speak to this, I'm sure, Mayor. They don't want him to expand that prevent the plant to do anything. Waste energy, in my opinion, is recycling. I mean, you know, what the hell is it? It is recycling. You're taking food scraps, you're taking everything, you're turning it into electricity. If that's not recycling, I don't know what it is. But besides that, state is not looking to have that happen anymore. So at some point in time, the Bristol plant, as well as the Bridgeport plant and so on, will, will come to the end of their terms as well, and they will cease to be. So now the only thing you're going to be doing is that you're going to be putting it on trucks, trains or otherwise, and finding landfills somewhere. And they're going to become more and more distant as they won't fill up and they and they're gone. Got it. So, and and uh, and, and that's the scenario with that. But lastly, and here's the last piece I want to say: recycling. The biggest problem with recycling is there's no value in the product. Nobody freaking wants it. It was great when China wanted all our recycling. We shipped it there. And I know if you were you were what very with Myra, we used to actually get rebates. Middlebury, you know, a lot of towns. We used to get rebates actually for our recycling. We're sending recycling at as value. Hey, guess what? Here's some money back at the end of the year. Well, that's all gone. And there's really no value for it in, in, anywhere anymore. Now, some segments of it might be. Uh, and one of the things I, you know, personally, I, I think should be looked into and is, is glass itself. If you store separated glass, there are places that will take that, not enough, but there are a couple in Connecticut that will grind it down. And then utilize that in concrete, or uh, and it could be utilized in asphalt. Well. I think they're doing, they're they're doing it all. They they are, but but not on a large scale. Right, yeah. not on a large scale, and there's not enough companies or businesses prepared to do that. But my to my point though, we should at at municipal levels, if you want to do something, have that separated out. Then it makes sense. Then it makes sense. So those are just some of the issues, and I could go on and on about this, but uh, I, I won't. Trust me, we've got a problem. We've got a major problem. Yes, we still have the ability to take care of it in-house here, but it's only going to get more and more expensive. And the concept of pay as you throw, how do you as a municipality turn around to your taxpayers and say, okay, now you're going to buy bags. Okay, we're going to we're going to take it out of our budget because now we're not going to have to tax you to do this, but you're going to buy the bags to dispose of, and that's how you're going to pay for it. I know personally, I did a study in my town some years ago because we're going to talk about removing us, you know, no longer the town paying for curbside pickup, right? And when I looked at it, I said what the private contractors would charge a resident versus the rate we were getting for obvious reasons, you know, scale. 
We saved them money. So why the hell would I have taken it out of my tax package in order to make them pay for it? And for that matter, towns like, towns like Congressman and many others would have to expand their transfer station capabilities to accept that MSW. So there are so many holes in the programs that, yeah. they're, that they're promoting. And purporting or promoting, I should say. Yeah, I There's so many holes in it. I we've talked about it here a little bit, and, and it's not an easy fix. But what we need to do is come together at the COG and create our own regional authority and figure out how we process from there and what we do from there. We'll and the bill, and this bill, if I remember correctly, or somewhere in legislation, will incentivize it to some extent. So I mean that's the road we need to yeah. go down. I don't doubt, George. Yeah, I, I I think I got three observations. Number one, we absolutely, in order for this uh, food waste project to work, we absolutely need the support of the public. Right. And, yeah. and what Ed is talking about makes a lot of sense. People aren't going to want to be spending their own money to get rid of their own food waste. You know, that's something that they think the pounds are different. Secondly, the whole thing is very labor intensive. Yes, it is. I, I think we're looking at a lot of new employees mm -hmm. that are doing different things. And the third observation that I have is that uh, the way it's explained, it's going to make a lot of bears in Oxford happy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're absolutely correct on that one as well. The little very short. Okay, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, we're getting close to lunchtime now. Yeah, you know, I, understand I, understand I understand your concern. <laughs> yeah. At least it's a rainy day. <laughs> My no tea time at noon. We're never going to fix it completely, but I love the regional idea and just a, a direction we could look at. When he talked about liquid waste and the sludge, if there's a way to digest liquid sludge with contaminants, like you're talking about separating. That's kind of fantasy land I, today. I, and I agree with right. you. So therefore, if you could take the food scraps and everything else and crush it, macerate it, create a liquid that has contaminants in it. It's, it's not just the food scraps, but it has contaminants in it and process it in a digester. Number one, you reduce volume by 40%. Number two to 60% that can be burned is dry. So it burns better, more efficiently. Now that's not a total solution, but it is a partial solution that, that it gets wiped out by this bill that we should talk about regionally. I agree, I agree. And, and in the interest of moving things along, uh, I, I really think that we'll do that workshop and I'm hoping to get a lot of participation because this stuff is really important. I think the thing that bothers me the most about the proposed legislation is that it's an enormous unfunded mandate. You guys, Absolutely. I mean, you're talking big. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, all hidden. Absolutely. People don't realize what's coming. It's insane. All right. Now, without further ado, uh, Mr. First Selectman George Temple, would you like to introduce your guest? Yes. Uh, Nikki, want to come up? This uh, Nikki Dijkstra, she works for the uh, Department of Labor uh, and uh, in an area that I didn't know. I'm a veteran myself. Vicky's a veteran, but uh, it's uh, to help uh, veterans find employment. Uh, Nikki, want to give a little... Yes, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I won't take a lot of your time. I know I wasn't on the agenda. Um, as uh, First Lady Temple said, my name is Nikki Dijkstra. I work for the Connecticut Department of Labor, um, specifically in Veterans Employment Service, which was a position that I didn't know existed until I found it on the state website and applied for it. Um, so I feel like this is a good opportunity for me to very quickly reach a lot of you about some services that are available for free and for your constituents who are veterans. Um, so I work out of the Bridgeport American Job Center. Um, there is one in Waterbury, of course. Uh, there's another one in Hamden, in uh, Hartford, and Montville. Those are the five full-service agencies. We have affiliate locations in other places, and Sonia Derby have, have one, Torrey's and has one, uh, Danbury. But in the five full-service locations are where the veterans are. And what we do is we work individually with veterans and help them find whatever type of employment it is that they're looking for. So that can be anyone from a Marine Corps rifleman who's 22 years old and just came back from his active duty time and has never held civilian employment before, 
and doesn't know how to put together a resume, has never gone to an interview, and doesn't know how to translate his military service into something that civilian employers understand. Uh, or it could be someone who's a Vietnam era veteran who maybe has spent the last several decades in construction and now wants to transition to something a little less labor intensive. Um, so we help those folks individually, um, creating a new resume, having targeted cover letters. Um, if they have not gone to interviews in a long time, we can do mock interviews with them and get them ready for what they might experience there. Um, and we also can connect them with other services if they're experiencing something like homelessness or substance abuse. We can refer them out to our partner um, agencies to help them, you know, handle those things, uh, get clothes that are you know, interview appropriate or whatever type of other uh, services they might need. Um, so as I mentioned, I work out of the out of the Bridgeport office, um, but veterans can go to any of the full service or any of the affiliate offices um, as they as they choose to. So what I've been seeing in a lot of the folks that are coming to the, the, the job center in Bridgeport where I work, unfortunately, is people are already in crisis mode. I'm a veteran, I didn't know the service existed. By the time they find us, they're usually there for unemployment insurance assistance. So they have filed an unemployment claim and maybe they're not getting anywhere or they have locked themselves out of their account or something like this. So by the time they come to us, they finally find us, they're, some of them are teetering on the edge of homelessness. They're you know, behind in the mortgage payments. So I'm, I'm hoping that I can let you all know about this in a way that we can maybe find people in a proactive manner. and catch folks before they're, you know, falling through the cracks. So I have um, a bunch of my business cards. I can hand them all out for you. If anyone gives me your email address, I can send you my flyer. So you can share that. Um, again, these services are all free. <laughs> so you can share that um, if you have like a town Facebook page that you use, or you can email it if you have a distribution list for like a newsletter. Um, but we really, again, would like to try to reach folks before they're, you know, really crisis situation. So. Um, I can answer any questions, or if you want to like marinate on that, I can just send my card. So, yes. so um, some of the towns in my proximity in the state, um, we all uh, utilize a service that comes out of Bristol. All right. And um, Donna Dognan is that individual. Are you familiar with Donna? And they, they, what's what's the veteran strong? So veterans we will make that point. So so I would I'm encouraging you to please reach out to Donna Dognan. That she's probably served, I don't know how many of our community charters, I don't know, seven or eight, maybe nine. Yeah. But at any rate, and we all utilize this one service center out of Bristol. Because many of us are small communities, and Donna's done a fine job for all of us. So please reach out to her with the service that you can assist her with and assist our veterans as well. I think it would be helpful as well, um, Nikki, if you put together your material and get it to Lauren here at the COG, and then she can blast it out to all the all the members of the COG, okay? okay? Thank you very much. And thanks for, are you related to Lenny? Thank you, Nikki. Thank you, George, for bringing Nikki to us. Thank you. All right. Um, public comment. Anyone here from the public that wishes to address the board? Okay. Um, Mr. Davis from Eversource, would you like to stand up and introduce yourself to the COG members? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, my name is Daniel Davis, uh, Eversource Community Relations. Uh, newly been assigned Waterbury. You know, I had a, a very good meeting of the mayor's office a couple of weeks ago uh, as I was transitioning into the Waterbury and the North Coast Valley. Uh, a few of you I haven't had a chance to meet with you. Uh, we've got some meetings on the books, so uh, be kind of the Middlebury and August of uh, short order. So just, you know, I wanted to come uh, introduce, you know, myself. So that way you all have a face with the name. I'll be emailing and inviting you uh, shortly uh, just to keep lines of communications open. I've got my colleague, she's uh, new with the company, Mackenzie Smiley. Uh, so please, uh, any issues with the company, throw them at me, not at her. We don't want to share away. Um, I just wanted to say hello and introduce myself, Danny Davis. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, don't worry, um, we won't be shy about bugging you either. <laughs> <laughs> well, he knows I've already done it yeah. a number of times. Yeah, welcome, Mackenzie. Okay, all right, now we got a roll. Um, item agenda number two, CNV MPO meeting. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff here. Uh, approval of the resolution 2023-08, TIP amendments, 
uh, projects. Um, <coughs> you can read them for yourselves. And uh, we'll call on uh, Kevin Ellis, please. Yeah, Ke Kevin is out today. So Elliot is going to, uh, Elliot Weir is online. Or actually, Elliot, why don't I just do a quick uh, review of the three projects? Um, basically, the, the, the uh, amendments are uh, cover three main projects. Uh, the first one is under the Transportation Alternatives Program. It's to add funding to the Steelbrook Greenway multi use trail in Watertown. Uh, and that project had been added earlier, but it's being moved from 23 to 24 for funding. The second one is adding uh, the signal modernization project in Bristol. Uh, this is a project that the uh, city was awarded uh, what's called CMAC funding to uh, improve traffic signals in, 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 the, in the city. Um, you know, design is scheduled for 23 and 24 with construction in an outer year. Uh, the third set of uh, amendments is relates to a statewide pavement marking, um, marking program. As you can see on your sheet, it's a long list of projects, and basically they're adding funding to cover this program over the next uh, four years. So there's a series of uh, you know, adding any funding under various uh, programs to do paper markings throughout the state. Thank you. Okay, any questions? There's yeah. actually oh, one oh, more. Yeah. Yeah. There's okay. one more. Oops. Oh, sorry. I I needed to go over one more page. <laughs> yep. and the, the last one is uh, adding a project in Southbury at Interchange uh, 17. Uh, this is a project that has been served, excuse me, affected 14. Um, this is a project that's sort of been in the study phase for quite a while, uh, and they're now adding it to the FIP uh, for uh, funding and 23 for construction. Uh, it will be improving the on and off ramps there and some improvements to the uh, Route 172 in that area. Okay, I do have a question. Mark, why, did I hear you right? We're changing the, uh, the TIP uh, on the segment of uh, Greenway Trail from Watertown from 23 to 24. If that's the one that would connect to Thomas. No, no, uh, this is Steel Brook. Oh, okay. uh, it, okay. it's, it's not the Nogtuck River Agreement. We're still working on trying to get that segment of Watertown started so it can okay. free up funding for your project. Itself. But no, this is Steel Brook. It's another Greenway they have in, in town. They applied for funding to uh, acquire some additional property and then construct another section. <laughs> Okay. I, I run it, we're working on that. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question on the Watertown one. Is okay. that to relieve yes. flooding? Is that to relieve flooding or that's I wasn't uh really no, it, it's that's it's not a flooding flood improvement. It's it's mainly just to build a uh they have a small short section of trail along the steel brook now. It's to extend that um a little bit further and um uh, Aaron may know, but uh, it actually, uh, Mark, you may know. Um, they're, they're going to be putting a new bridge over part of the Steelbrook as well. Uh, That's correct. On the yeah. More, we're going to be closing the trail. It will be a small bridge. Right. right. So it, it's funding to acquire some additional property, extend the trail, and then build it. And part of it is is adding the uh, the, the bridge. But it's it's a trail project mm -hmm. as opposed to flood uh, remediation type project. Other questions? Motion. So move for everything. Second. Any more discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Against? <laughs> Motion passes. Item agenda number three, NV COG administrative item 3A, and approval of the minutes from the January 13th, 2023 meeting. So move. Second. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Item agenda three. I wasn't there. Yeah. Item agenda, thank you. Item agenda 3B, approval of agency financial reports and summaries from the period of 131-23. Uh, Michael? Well, Mike had a family emergency this okay. morning, so he's not able to attend. He did send out an email um, with a very quick uh, summary of his financial reports. Um, I can go through those very quickly uh, if you'd like. Um, going through the highlights for the uh, uh, January report is, you know, we're still operating on track with a balanced budget by the end of the year. Our net position is $143,762. Uh, there's no 
no unexpected funding cuts or no uh, significant expenses other than you know legal expenses from like Kinney Town Dam, which we're hoping to get reimbursed when the project is actually awarded. Um, and pretty much everything is on target. Um, and you know, we're uh, what, what would that be? Seven seven months out of the year, and you know we're doing doing pretty well and on target to have a balanced budget. Questions? Motion approved. So moved. Moved to accept. I'll second. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 I think we're going to table item three C. Okay. I, I I think that the financial guy's got to be here to talk about the audit okay. report. So we'll that, move that to the next meeting. Item agenda 3D, approval of the fiscal year 2023 mid-year budget adjustments. Do you want to do handle that? Yeah, I'll do, again, very quickly, uh, Mike wanted to make some adjustments to move to March. <laughs> oh, oh you, okay, move to the March board meeting. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay. But basically, again, he just wants to uh, consider some adjustments to the budget because of uh, some additional funding that may be available to the to the uh, cog that we had not anticipated at the beginning of the year. So, but uh, we can move that to the March meeting. How about E approval of the fiscal year 2024 preliminary budget estimate. And that that definitely, I think we should move to, to March. March. Okay. How about F director's report, legislative update. Drew. Morning. Um, so, as you know, Rector is uh, not with us today, so I'm going to pass with the quick legislative update, and I won't take too much time. We're very early in the session, obviously, still. Um, I know we've heard on a couple of the items today, including the, the governor's bill, like MFW, all things that we're tracking internally. Our internal team is kind of watching the public hearings every day, watching the committee meetings, um, and we're working up memos, we're working with CCM, we're working with costs, and, and trying to roll together um, on the on behalf of uh, our community. So we're tracking legislation that affects the 19 municipalities in the region, um, all that that is proposed by our legislators that represent the region, and anything else uh, of general interest. So um, if there is anything I would say that any one of you individually has an eye on um, that you want to track for you and, and provide updates, uh, just hit me up with that individually via email, and I'm happy to do so. I, I have a list through the Connecticut General Assembly that we're all tracking. Um, we've got SN on the, the planning and land use things, and uh, we've got Christine on the uh, environmental things. And then Jack is still with us, even though he's not physically here in Connecticut, and watching a lot of the general legislative stuff, as well as uh, I'm doing the same. So uh, we're on top of it. It's just, it's, it's interesting with 2,500 to 3,000 bills proposed, a lot, a lot to wade through. And a lot of this stuff is going to die on the vine still. So we're not being really reactive. But if there is anything that we see up front that's just bad legislation, bad verbiage, whatever we are um, submitting uh, testimony and or just uh, verbal changes through the CT COG board, which is when all the directors kind of get together and put their heads together and are seeing these things. So, um, so far, so good. And I know, Mayor O'Leary, you were at the event this week at the Waterbury Chamber uh, in Southbury, as was Desra and, and Mayor Hess. One thing I did like, and I did hear from um, Speaker Ritter multiple times, is that they are fully committed, the state is fully committed to funding the ECS this year. So I think that'll be music to everybody's ears. Um, he, he actually guaranteed that. So, um, so hopefully that, that's... I don't know why the governor didn't do that. <laughs> he did, right? You heard it, right? I almost <laughs> heard it. You, I'll give you one to keep an eye on quickly. is the uh, the bill that's uh, been um, proposed in labor, and it's going to come out of labor. Mm -hmm. And the bill is, is that any uh, municipalities who are not members of CMERS, adopt the CMERS model yep. uh, for their pensions yep. for your individual towns, right. which includes overtime and pensions and extra duty work and pensions. And they want to drag everybody into the water. It's got to huh? be, I mean, they're underwater as it is, so they want everybody to drown together. So keep an eye on that one. I don't think it's going anywhere, but you never know. That that one is probably, that is, is, 
extremely onerous. And you've moved away from the pension system here in Waterbury, just like many other towns and municipalities have. I know we had in Thomason years ago, went to a 457B, but now they're going to tell us, now you're not good enough anymore. you got to do what we want you yeah. to do. We still and that's extremely, do you? I thought, yeah. you, I thought you did away with it. No. We it, can't get anybody to work here with a pension. No, okay. Well, sorry about that. But I, I thought you Unless did. You have a, I thought you did. Right. I, I think. <laughs> I believe Torrington did. And AR-15. So at any rate, uh, you know, it, it's an onerous bill mandating upon local municipalities things that we have, we internally have legislatively changed. Mayor? Yes, sir. Drew, multiply that times a thousand for Norga Tucker, right? <laughs> We're dead set against that. We've solved our pension problem for now and the future. Yeah. And wrong. they want us to take our 401k people who are now way larger group than our other people and put them back on, it's, it would kill us. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So I, I really put that on your radar. Let me ask you this one, Mayor. You may have some insight on it. What about the uh, the, the piece with the firefighters and the- uh, Cancer uh, presumption? Yeah, yeah. Cancer presumption and, and the fund that we had agreed to last year, a, main, a means by which to repair or remediate. Where is that? So the, the legislation that was agreed upon to fund the cancer presumption bill as actually two years ago uh, was deemed to be um, inadequate. inadequate or unconstitutional or all the above. It never would have worked anyway. There was a quick fix at the time to get the firemen off their back. Look, so are we you young? are, some of you are too young or too old or too <laughs> young. <laughs> <laughs> to remember the heart and hypertension bill. Ooh, yeah. If you thought the heart and hypertension bill broke your city in half like it did cities like Waterbury, the cancer, cancer, listen, I am very sympathetic to firefighters. My father's a career firefighter. But the cancer presumption bill now opens up all cancers. All. And, and with your health coverage, would be responsible in your city for disability related pensions for those individuals who develop any form of cancer and in their capacity as paid or volunteer. and volunteer. I mean, yep. brace yourselves. Yep. That's all I'm saying. I, I, you know, it's a, so it's a tough thing to talk about because. We've got four or five Waterbury firefighters right now uh, who are, you know, have different forms of cancer. And two of them, quite frankly, are very, very serious. So it's hard to talk about. But the reality is, is as municipal and town leaders, I, I, I just don't know how you can afford it. I just don't know how anybody can afford it. And I, I feel bad. But there's a lot of teachers who get cancer. So there's a lot of cops who get cancers. There's a lot of everybody who get cancers. And this is where I get myself in trouble every time. The number of fires is down like 80% across the board. And of course, the fire suppression, you know, the sprinklers and all the alarms and all the things that now the technology is so fantastic that the fires that do start get really for the most part could extinguish really quickly so i look this is a tough thing to talk about but i would just put it on your radar because it's really important for your fiscal stability of your cities and towns moving forward did it come out of committee i don't think it's gotten out of committee yet but i'm told it will just like the seamers things coming out mm -hmm, of committee. Mm -hmm. so it's labor the labor committee yeah. is made up of all labor. Yeah. yeah. They're not going to yeah. vote. Not, they're not going to vote. They're going to vote it out, the committee. So, yeah. The, you know, those are public hearings. And, you know, you don't look it. There's one good thing about public hearings. You don't have to testify in person. But you certainly, if you feel strongly right. about a subject, you should submit the written testimony. It is uncomfortable testifying in person because they attack you. And then that is a problem. But if you submit the written testimony, it's on the record. And believe me, those legislators who are on the fence on these issues, if you give written testimony, you give them cover. So I would suggest that you take a moment in time to do that. And you can, you can also 
potentially uh, testify virtually now yeah as well the problem is is and i was going to testify on one particular piece of legislation i became 32 on the list and at 5 30 and i had a meeting to go to a for a board of finance meeting right which was important for me to attend to right uh number 12 was, was being called yeah <laughs> So there you that's go. typical. That's not really yeah. saying. No, I know that. But I'm, I'm just that. saying it's it's very difficult yeah. to testify in person. So I've maybe been there and attack me. I don't care. I'm good with it. Maybe the play is that we do we we address it on rather and see if we can get everybody to sign it or the chief elected officials to sign it. I I would like that to happen. That's a good idea. So why don't we do that, uh, Mark? Yeah, you can yeah because uh, look at I mean we're getting to the point true. where these things aren't that tough to talk about anymore because it's just it. it when something doesn't work, it doesn't work. And pick a category. We we think we're going to be all things to all people all the time, and it just it just doesn't work. I agree. Okay, uh, Joanna. Well, before we move on, I just have a couple of other. Uh, Mark, uh, seriously. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> no, I just want. <laughs> Go ahead. I was no, going to ask you for an update on Rick later. Okay. But, okay. okay. Yeah, I thought so it would be a good time to do it now. Uh, no, just a quick update on Rick. Uh, condition is doing well. Uh, however, he uh, is expecting not to be back, uh, able to be more mobile for another until beginning of March. He was hoping end of next week he was going to be able to start uh, being a little bit more present. But uh, now they're he's thinking more like the first second week in March. And it's going to be probably closer to the end of March before he'll be allowed to drive independently. So he'll still be kind of remote uh, for, for quite a while. But all in all, he's doing well um, in a lot of pain. Um, and they haven't even you know begun uh, the rehab yet. So when rehab starts, he'll probably really see feel a lot of pain. Yeah. But that, that that's his big thing is uh, yeah, because of the surgery, you know, just you know, where the incisions were made. It's not so much his back where they did the surgery, but you know, just where they did the incision so but he's doing well um and if you know he, he always says he's not gonna he doesn't want any emails or texts or anything and he won't respond but he always seems to do do that you know <laughs> he has the time and and uh he's he's constantly sending us uh you know, emails so yeah. but all in all doing well good to know and we're not surprised he was uh, uh optimistic as we were <laughs> yeah and the other luck and tell them to stay away from scooters too. Yeah. <laughs> That's probably why he's it. Yeah. I know. You just couldn't yeah. make that up. No. <laughs> I mean, yeah, people are still talking about that. I was at a dinner just the other day and they were talking about it. It was the greatest thing, but I'm a little worried about him. And I'm worried about him because he's on these pain pills for a long time. Now. Yeah. And uh, you know, I, I got such a fear for that. You know, I think he's going to, you know, we've got to keep close eye on him, make sure he's okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, the only other comment uh, or uh, announcement is we do have a new staff member. Uh, we have uh, Tayo, excuse me, Tayo Olehi uh, is now a new transportation planner with the agency. Uh, he started working a couple of weeks ago. He's finishing up a, a PhD doctorate program at the University of Alabama, uh, but he'll be working under Rich Donovan on a lot of our transportation programs. So I um, want to welcome uh, Hi, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Hi, Kyle. Thank you. Welcome aboard. Thank you, sir. We try to put him uh, right to work and get uh, involved in a lot of different projects. So just want to introduce him real quickly. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, item agenda four, emergency management. Good morning, everybody. Finally. <laughs> I know. Uh, so, so, so we have uh, in person with today. We're very happy about that. I saw Mr. Field. How are you, sir? Good, sir. How are you? Good, Good thank you. First, of all, I'm just going to go quickly through some uh, items that I would like you guys to know about. Uh, Connecticut Municipal <laughs> Unmanned Aerial Vehicles Task Force. Uh, oh, was having a drone conference on March 11th in Shelton at the um, Echo Rose Trading Center. A Connecticut Conference of Municipalities is having an emergency management conference. This is a one day statewide municipal event, and it's being held in our very own prospect at ARIA. Um, regarding community emergency response team, Waterbury Department of Health is considering a search, and it's going to be affiliated with the city of uh, Waterbury, so that's hopefully going to go through soon. 
training opportunities for CERT, uh, train the trainer free course is being held on March 11th and October 5th. Um, the uh, statewide council and citizen corps council wants to make more annual training days available for the volunteers. And the next quarterly uh, state statewide citizen council corps meeting is on April 20th. And leaving floor to Nadia. Thanks, Joanna. Good morning, everyone. Good to see everyone in person. Uh, just a couple of things real quick. Um, you should have gotten the new LEOP template, the local emergency operation template, uh, and uh, there's money tied to that. So um, by standard, it's due this year. So if you get it in by uh, January 1st, 2024, you will get $5,000. Uh, so in the new template basically is a, I, I call it a plug and patch. Just you know, plug in your information if that's what you want to do. Um, and it works for you, you can just plug in your information and it works in the LEO template. It's actually um, got all the new annexes in it in regards to the new standards that have come out the state statute and all that kind of stuff. So um, the other thing is there's a lot of planning going on with migrant. Um, I, I bring this up very carefully because we are not receiving any migrants or have we been given the heads up we're going to get them, but um, we have been doing some planning on that. Uh, there's actually going to be a tabletop exercise with a couple of the bigger cities in Hartford next week. Um, so I know we've had some conversation with Waterbury, especially on this. And, uh, actually, looking at uh, the possibilities if it does happen, what's the game plan? And uh, BDS uh, or DSS, Department of Social Services, uh, DJ was uh, the one that initiated the whole planning process. And then uh, at this point, that was the over. And uh, basically he's uh, doing all the planning now for that. Um, and it looks like um, the state is going to try to um, support any uh, influx of migrants that come into any of the municipalities, um, but they're trying to carefully figure out how they're gonna do that. So there's a lot of different agencies involved in the departments that are uh, working on this uh, stuff. Um, so the, uh, we also got from our REP team, we got some legal questions that were forwarded to us. Uh, when we had the last training up in Litchfield for the CEOs, there was a bunch of legal questions that started to come out. And then there was, uh, you know, there was some talk in regards to having our legal team come out and actually do a presentation for the CEOs. Out of that came those questions. I met with our legal team last week and hopefully we'll have a written response to those legal questions um, coming up real soon. So the attorney's working on it. We had discussions and tried to explain exactly what we were looking for and all that kind of stuff. So I'll be able to, I'll be able to share all that with you guys when we get that out. Um, Eversort, uh, there's been a lot of meetings going on. They got not a lot of new people. <laughs> As you see, Dan, it, it, you know, Van is here, Mackenzie's here, but there's a it, pretty much new liaison across the board. Um, so we're <coughs> reaching out to all the municipalities to actually uh, meet with them. So we continue to try to support whatever they're doing there uh, in regards to that. And then the last thing I have is uh, we're doing, we're trying to put together a regional strategic training plan. Um, so we have uh, a presentation that will be taking place. It's a two day presentation. Peaks comes out and actually goes over the process for doing that. And we're trying to get as many of our uh, emergency support function people involved in that so we can get a true regional training plan uh, put together. Um, so we're trying to make it all inclusive as much as possible. So, but that's all I have, sir, pending any questions. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everything that you, you guys do for us. Okay, item agenda five, Advocat Planning and Transportation. Presentation by David Lukens of OPM regarding statewide broadband. Good morning, everyone. Uh, should I be sharing my screen or is it, are you, is it going to be pulled up? It's being pulled up. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, thank you all for having us. And also for what it's worth, this, uh, it's been very interesting listening to the last hour and a half. So thank you for having me. Um, so again, I'm David Lukens. <laughs> <laughs> um, David Lukens, uh, I'm the broadband mapping coordinator at the Office of Policy and Management uh, in the GIS office. Uh, so we've been tasked with the uh, sort of mapping, data collection and mapping of broadband. And then that sort of, uh, we, we pass that information on to our partners 
at the Commission for Education and Technology, the Office of Consumer Counsel, and the uh, and Deep. And I've brought Kevin Pasashich from Deep. He's in charge of the Bureau of Energy and Technology Policy. Something, uh, <laughs> and he's he's the purse strings of the grant programs. So uh, I brought him because I'm sure you will have questions about that side of things. Uh, but first whenever a PowerPoint does appear, I just wanna give you a sort of a, a rundown of what we've done at the state in terms of data collection and mapping, then tell you how that looks in NBCOG, and then tell you, you know, what we're doing and how we are hoping to partner more closely with localities and COGS, make sure that we have all of our data as right as possible. And we can, once the federal funds really start flowing, we can get those programs as accurate as possible. Um, I do not see slides. I might be looking at the wrong thing. Should I see slides right now? Does everyone else see slides? Yes. Yeah, how's that? Better? I don't know. Let me switch the view that I have here. I, I see a black screen. So I know what the slides are. So <laughs> I'm just going to go with it. And uh, please move to the second slide, the outline slide. We're there. We're okay. good. We're at it. Okay. Okay. All right. So uh, I'm just going to go through some general stuff about what we've done, get to that data that we have in NVCOG, and then talk about next steps, areas for cooperation, and hand it off to Kevin for any questions on specific funding opportunities. Uh, slide three, please. Uh, so OPM completed two rounds of collection from uh, ISPs where we asked them for address level data about every location that they serve in the state. Uh, as you can imagine, this is not an exercise in perfection. Uh, a lot of ISPs don't actually know what all of the addresses are in their service area. And for what it's worth, the state was missing 400,000 addresses across the state that we've now added into our address fabric. So it can be kind of tricky trying to figure out how all this actually fits together. Um, we took all that, we put the ISP data with our addresses, and all of that data is now available in an aggregated form at broadbandmaps.ct.gov. Uh, so you can go there, you can see areas where there are higher levels of unserved locations. That's locations that don't have access to 25 megabits per second download and three megabits per second upload. Um, you can see adoption data there, which we also collected from ISPs. That's at the census tract level. Uh, so we collected the number of subscriptions at each tier uh, from all the ISPs at the track level. And also just to make sure everyone's aware, there is now an FCC broadband map. Um, this map was created by the FCC sort of with a similar methodology that we used, but they required that all providers pro report data in the same way. And that means that some providers that didn't already have that data in the way that they wanted it, did some really crazy things to get it ready. Uh, and so it's a mess. Um, if you go and look at that FCC website and zoom in, there are you know lots of locations in Waterbury that are on train tracks and uh, you know a lot of a lot of interesting places that we at the state are working to clean up. And I'll talk about that a little in a little bit again. But both of these resources are available if you or your constituents have a particular area of concern. Please visit these websites, check out how that data is represented. Let me know if you see something that's wrong. We know it's not perfect. I will report it to the FCC. I can report it to ours and, and get our stuff right as well. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so just in terms of NVCOG, I wanna just quickly highlight what availability, competition and adoption look like across the region. Um, in terms of availability, we have only 360 locations out of 167,000 in NVCOG that show up as unserved. And it's, right, it's important to note, that means that can't get 25 megabits per second down by three megabits per second up. So overall, NVCOG is in pretty good shape. We do have some areas that have uh, slightly higher concentrations of unserved locations. And that number is different according to the FCC. The FCC says it's about 600. But as I said, some of those locations are just railroad tracks. And so we're still in the process of making sure those things are square. And that's part of what I want to talk to all of you about today is how I can best, you know, make sure that we're in, uh, we're in communication and we're, getting, we're making sure that all of the right locations are covered. Uh, in some cases, we are, have been, 
we get reports from ISPs that yes, we serve this area, but there might be a multi-dwelling unit. Uh, there might be some form of housing that we don't have accurately in our maps. And you might know about that area not having service. We'd love to hear about it. I'll mention this again, but on broadbandmaps.ct.gov, there is a report unserved location function. Any resident, anyone can go on. It's just three questions. Report the location, tell us what's wrong with it. We'll figure it out. Um, so please do encourage your residents to do that if they talk about an area. Uh, we are working on getting some sort of phone reporting system set up for those that don't have uh, internet access as it's kind of hard to report via the internet if you don't have the internet, um, but we're working on it. Um, next slide, please. Um, in terms of competition as well, Naugatuck Valley is doing fairly well. Uh, we want to really encourage competition as much as possible because that's what helps with bringing prices down. And in a lot of Naugatuck Valley, there are you know upwards of four providers, but there are uh, a number of areas with only two. Uh, in, within NBCOG, there's Altice, Charter, Comcast, GoNetSpeed, and Frontier. And many of these providers are expanding their reach but it's really important that as municipal leaders, you all stay in contact with those providers because some of them are trying to roll out new areas, but uh, don't always think about some of the contingencies and the areas that really need coverage, despite the fact that you think they know those things, lots of times they don't. So if there's an area that you're concerned about and we can provide mapping and help contact you with someone, please let us know on that as well. And then, uh, what I really want to focus on in terms of a, a highlight of the data that we've collected is that throughout Connecticut, and especially in an area like NBCOG that has very few unserved locations, it really in Connecticut is more of an, uh, an issue of adoption over availability. Uh, so for example, if we say about 350 locations in NBCOG lack access to broadband service, over 300, over 30,000, excuse me, locations lack a broadband description at all, according to our data. So that's businesses and households. Even more than that, and I apologize in advance for the busyness of this graph, I really didn't wanna do it, but it is the best way for this particular data. So you see here, these colors break down the type of subscription. And so I've named uh, like buckets of subscription speeds, unserved subscriptions, underserved subscriptions, served subscriptions, and gig C or uh, subs. And so that's unserved again is 25 by three or less. Underserved is 25 three to 100 by 20. Served subscriptions are over 120 and gig C is the state goal of one gigabit by 100 megabits per second. And so what we can see here is that Watertown uh, happens to have, you know, 70%. Thomaston has 60% of its re of its residences and business with served or better subscriptions. But those numbers are significant outliers in the state. And even in NBCOG, most towns, something like 60 or 70% of residents uh, have a download and upload speed combination that the FCC would say is underserved. So this means a couple of things. In some cases, it means that residents really don't need or think they need uh, that, that higher speed. And when that's the case, that's, that's fine. Um, but when it has to do with education that they don't know what packages are available and how that's something we're concerned about. And so this, this suggests that we really wanna make sure that one, uh, education efforts can, can be well uh, managed between the state and localities. But also second, and probably the most, and most importantly, is affordability. Um, if you do a regression analysis of census tracts, poverty, and their adoption rates, about 70% of that differential is accounted for by poverty rates. So we, we understand that affordability is the primary issue. So we wanna emphasize that the affordable connectivity program is available. We have data on that on our website and would be happy to share that with towns. You know, what areas do you have that uh, may be undersubscribed and how we can help with outreach there. But also we wanna make sure that we are dealing with that problem through things like promoting competition and making sure that education is available. Um, just to one more time talk about the FCC data. The FCC data is what will directly 
uh, condition how we get to spend federal funds. So we are in the process of challenging locations, trying to make sure that everything is squared up. But I just wanted to give you all a sense, you know, I gave you those two numbers that it's about 600 and 350, where the FCC says there are more unserved locations. This is kind of what that difference looks like. In some places we have more, in some places the FCC has more, but a lot of them are uh, in strange locations. And in both data sets, uh, a large proportion of the unserved locations are what we would call non-standard installations or long driveways. These are areas where the building is at least 300 feet from the public right-of-way. And for a cable provider, for example, they're probably going to have to charge additional uh, fees to connect that home. And so again, making sure that we're uh, sharing information and talking about how we can best uh, understand the locations that are unserved in your area is something that's really important to our office. So on that, um, if, if there are areas where you know that something is unserved and you don't see it being represented on our maps or the FCC, please let us know with that uh, service availability, availability report function. I realize just now that as I've been talking and moving the slides on my screen, I can't see your, your screen. Um, so, <laughs> If we can go to slide nine, <laughs> I apologize. We've been pretty well, Dave. We've been aligned oh, pretty well. Great. Some somebody's doing a, a great job. While I make a mistake. All right. Um, so, uh, in terms of cooperation, like I said, we have that service availability report. It's really easy, really fast. If any resident you have you hear is having a problem with this, please let us know. It can include just that their service is not working like it's supposed to. That's a field available as well. So please let your residents know that this is available. Um, and if you are interested, please go check out the FCC map. The other big sort of data collection thing that I wanted to share with you is that we are currently looking for community anchor institutions that we may not know about, right? And so as part of the uh, IIJA programs for broad, uh, digital equity, uh, community anchor institutions can be any community support organization that facilitates the broader, uh, the greater use of broadband. And so that definition really expands what we can look at in terms of funding potential programs or helping people get connected to higher speeds. And so I, uh, I have included a link here and I'll paste it in the chat for uh, any community anchor institution. You can send it directly to them. They just report to us, okay, do you provide some digital training? Yes or no, where are you? Do you serve any of these populations? And then we can put them in our database, make sure that we know about them and provide any support that we can to them. Um, just that's it for me. I just wanna pass it over to Kevin real quick so that he can uh, you know, give you some details about funding. And I'm gonna paste some links in the chat. If there's an email I can send those links to as well, uh, please let me know and I'll make sure to do that. Thank you. Okay, questions anybody? Comments? <laughs> nice job. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. Okay, 5Bs and boy, MTP update, Rich. Yeah, so I'm sure you'll all be happy to hear. We do not need to adopt the MTP today, so this will be very brief. Um, the timeline allows us to address it at our March CNV MPO meeting, and so that is currently the plan. That meeting will also align with the end of our public comment period. We did hold our first public information meeting last evening uh, and have a, a series of other events scheduled all available on our website. Um, Rich, if you can go forward just one slide. Uh, as you all know, we did put out uh, on the table um, at our last board meeting, a copy of the executive summary, which is still available as a draft on our website. At this point now, the, the entire document is available in draft form. We would love any comments that you, your municipal staff or residents may have about this. Um, included in next month's uh, adoption will be the congestion management process for the bridgeport Stamford urban area, the Connecticut Department of Transportation's air quality conformity determination, and then the overall, uh, the overall MTP, which we are calling Envision 50. And so uh, all of that material is available right now on our website at nvcogct.gov slash envision50. Um, and again, any help uh, that we can, or any help you can offer sharing this document and the drafts of this document with, with residents and municipal staff would be fantastic. Okay. Hey, hey Rich, is the air quality uh, 
update include the, uh, the plume coming from East Palestine, Ohio? <laughs> You there. know, it does not, but uh, yes. I certainly could smell it out there this morning. I don't know if you guys could. Mm -hmm. What a disaster. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Huh? Okay. Any other comments, questions? Anything else? Anything else, Rich? Thank you, Rich. Okay, Ricardo. Environmental planning, brownfield project update. I'm, I'm going to be extremely brief. Uh, oh, come on. <laughs> that, that's what everybody said. Yeah, I just want to let you know that. We can roll in favor. We get to this month um, uh, to our lab board, provide supplemental funding for 359 and 0 Andrew, 359 Mill Street, Waterbury, and uh, 0 Andrew Ave. Uh, paperwork from uh, the legal department is currently uh, being developed. Uh, we should have resolution and the sites funded within the next 30 days or less. So that's good. Uh, the 70 North slash 59 Phil Street um, Thornton project and 501 East Main project are in the underwriting phase. Uh, all sites previously funded are going uh, according as planned. So that's good news. Um, if you want more uh, information on those sites, uh, a memo is is included in your uh, agenda packet. Um, wanted to give you guys the heads up that DECD did release a new uh, funding round, round 17. And quick highlights on that is a uh, municipal grant program for remediation with limited assessment, a max of $4 million grant for uh, municipalities, nonprofits. Uh, for the assessment only, it's a max of $200,000 for um, Applicants, but if you partner with a COG or a land bank, the max would be five hundred thousand. Um, and then targeted brownfields development loan program from DECD, there's a max of four million dollar loan per project. So if you guys have any questions on um, how to apply, or you guys want to partner with uh, the COG or land bank uh, to um, submit an application, or just need assistance, let us know. We're willing to help. Uh, send an email to uh, Stephen and I. I uh, also wanted to let you know that uh, EPA also released their new funding uh, round. Um, so uh, NB Cog is currently has a supplemental. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to try to get the RLF board together one more time to uh, award the pending sites that we were that that were discussed in the last meeting, uh, making the Cog eligible to submit another application. Uh, the goal is for somewhere around one million as a low number to three million max. That's all I have. You have any questions? For pretty young. No, I just to encourage uh, all of our members to take a look at this stuff. I mean, I know you're doing a lot out there in Bristol, uh, but you know, there's there's opportunities. Yeah, we just finally signed the paperwork this past week for a two million dollar grant from yeah. our sessions building. Yeah, they're, they're complicated. They take a lot, but two million dollar cleanup for a historic building is going to be pretty cool. That's great. And there is some money out there. Right? I'm working on yeah. Rick Miller too. I got a unique idea, but that's awesome. Okay, um, item agenda six B. Aaron is going to give us an update on MSW. Thank you, Chairman. I know it's a hot topic today. Um, so <laughs> the uh, trash reduction pilots in Ansonia, Woodbury, and Seymour are all now underway. Uh, Cog staff's been assisting those communities with outreach to residents. We're also beginning to plan for a 2023 composter and rain barrel sale, uh, and we'll share details with you all as soon as we have them. Uh, to First Selectman Moan's point earlier, um, CTDEP has announced a grant program to help municipalities and regional organizations evaluate interest in expanding existing or creating new regional waste authorities, and there's $1.5 million uh, statewide available. Cogstaff started putting together an application that would fund a study to investigate the region's needs and how a new or expanded regional waste authority could help support municipal efforts. Uh, the deadline for that is March 30th. Uh, we'll be providing details to you as we develop the application, uh, and we plan to uh, uh, discuss it more in depth at the March board meeting. But to your point, to, to your point Mr. Chairman, we'd be happy to set up that forum that you discussed and um you know in, include the discussion about this this opportunity as well in that yeah sounds good sounds good aaron so we will uh, we'll reach out to you mayor to to uh mm -hmm. to start planning for that okay great i like it um and, and then on to the next point uh oh, the okay time 
Uh, so, well, the Deep Rec Trails uh, grant program deadline is March 1st. We've been busy assisting members with applications. Uh, NBCI is going to be very well represented this round. We have, uh, we're preparing support letters for projects in Ansonia, Beacon Falls, Bethlehem, Bristol, Derby, Naugatuck, Oxford, Seymour, Thomaston, Waterbury, Watertown, and Wolcott. So if you're planning to oh, submit, you're really not included nice. on that list, <laughs> uh, let me know as soon as possible. How, how come I got left out? <laughs> um, yeah, if you, if you are submitting something, you know, let us know and we can we can certainly provide a support letter. Um, and then on to Kinneytown, um, as we discussed at the last meeting, uh, NOAA has announced that NVCOG will be receiving a grant uh, for the removal of Kinneytown Dam. That grant funding is getting closer. Uh, we've negotiated the scope with NOAA and submitted all the required paperwork. We've been told to expect uh, to have funding agreement in place sometime in March with the project start date of April 1st. Uh, following the advice of the board, we've also filed for reimbursement of legal fees going back to September 1st, which would allow us to recoup, recoup about uh, $60,000 in legal fees. Uh, Rick signed a term sheet late last month on behalf of the Brownfield Land Bank that outlined terms of the proposed purchase of Kinneytown Dam from Kinneytown Hydro. That was a non-binding agreement, and our attorneys right now are drafting a binding asset purchase agreement that would be ex executed as soon as possible. Uh, we do not expect the closing to take place before April at this point, but we will be able to begin the design and engineering work regardless of hold, who holds the title. So I'd be happy to answer any questions about any of that. Uh, any questions for Aaron? Yes, sir. Uh, not so much a question, but I just want to do uh, publicly thank Aaron. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we had a private dam in town that uh, sprung a leak, and for a while there was a concern that uh, we could be looking at uh, a dam failure. And unfortunately, um, if that were to happen, that would threaten our downtown. Um, so Deep came out and uh, Aaron was kind enough to uh, get out there as soon as he could to take some aerial photos. It's a difficult spot to get to to inspect. Luckily, they determined that um, the risk of anything imminent um, is very low, uh, partially due to the photos that Aaron was able to take. So I just wanted to thank him for his prompt response and coming out. It was a big help. Thank you. Good job, Aaron. You're very welcome. Anybody else? All right, cool. Um, item agenda other is the NB COG year in review. And I think uh, Mark and I discussed this. I think, first of all, we need, we really need to have Rick here for that. Uh, so we'll table it for now. And second of all, you know, I think one of the best things that's happened not only this past year, but probably maybe in the history of this NB COG is the Kinney Town Dam work. So, I really want Rick around for all that and discussion, and you know, I and we're still having a Christmas party, but maybe we'll. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting for Diorio. Easter, maybe we'll have what about a St. Town Dad party. St. Patrick's Day. Oh, listen, I get enough of St. Patrick's Day party. <laughs> <laughs> but we are going to turn the cross to fill the somewhere else. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Making a hand Absolutely. around the right. <laughs> Does anybody else have anything under other? Well, I, I was really concerned we were going to go beyond <laughs> noon. I was getting nervous. I started, we don't think we've ever gone beyond noon, but uh, Move to adjourn. turn us on the table. Second, all <laughs> those in favor, say aye. 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 Have a beautiful weekend, everybody. It's a, it's a,